Yes, yes. We have an exciting class today. First off, I've got a student group here from the Formula One and Baja team club. So they're building a Formula One car. So I'm going to pass this over to Matt and Josh. They're both in this class. Yes, give them a round of applause to start. All right. Test it. There we go. So I'm Matt Hannock. This is Josh. Uh, he's the treasurer. I'm the president of SAE Formula One in Baja. It's a uh, new club. We're getting started here. Uh, let's see. Hold on. So we're part of SAE, which stands for Society of Automotive Engineers. It's a professional organization. They're the ones that set the standards for many of the things in the automotive industry, uh, such as the bolts, uh, thread count, all those things are all set by this group. Uh, we're the student chapter. It's a little bit of a technical thing. Uh, we're working on becoming a student chapter and actually working with the professional portion, but that's in the process. We're not there yet. Mainly, we're geared towards mechanical engineers, uh, but we'll take any, anybody, any discipline, anyone who's interested in the automotive industry. What we're doing, we're going to design, build, and compete with a Formula One and Baja style vehicle, uh, as you can see from up here. Uh, should be a lot of fun, hopefully. The Formula One is a uh, small race car. We've got to build it from the ground up. We've got to do everything from engine, transmission. We've got to build the drivetrain, chassis, do the electrical system, program the computers, whole nine yards. And we compete with other colleges that have built similar cars in, a, in both dynamic and static events. The Baja is a as you can see, it looks about like the size of a Polaris Razor, any of the side-by-side -side ATV uh, units. It's a lot the same, except for there's no engine work. The engine's provided for us, so all we do is suspension and chassis. <clears throat> the events that are included, the uh, dynamic events, are acceleration, hill climb, maneuverability, rock crawl, obstacle course. There's a couple other ones, depending on uh, what you're, where you're competing at. Our goal, uh, we're trying to, trying to get this thing started. It's been attempted a couple of times in the past and has not succeeded. So the first thing is to actually get to competition. For the Formula One, we're looking for, we're gonna have to get about 50,000 just to get to the competition. To be competitive, probably closer to 100,000. This is meant mostly for mechanical engineers. Mechanical engineering makes up one third of the college here at UNR. So we want to make this the shining point of the college, of the department. And this is something to show to incoming students, so on. We really want to build this up big. And as I mentioned earlier, we're working on forming a collegiate chapter with the professional side of the SAE. Who we're looking for? Engineering students, uh, anybody interested in automotive? Mostly it's for mechanical engineers, but Electrical, computer, structural, uh, civil, because there is some structural stuff to it. We'll take just about anybody who wants, who's interested. The biggest thing we need is just people that are dedicated to getting to, the, getting to competition and achieving our goals. Why you should join? Uh, when, you, if we, when we do get to competition, and if we can get this going and make it year after year, it puts you in contact with a lot of people that work for Ford, Daimler, Chrysler, uh, possibly Mercedes, any of these major auto manufacturers. So anybody that's looking to get into that as an engineer, this is a good way to do it. During school, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it builds your, your understanding of all things engineering. You have to apply every aspect. Everything you learn is going to go into this car. And it establishes connections with other students that will allow you to network and if you need help on something, 
they, they're going to help support you on that. The way to join, first thing, show up to the meetings. We, were, we are posting them on Facebook and keeping that all up to date. The Facebook page is UNR SAE Formula One in Baja. The other thing, anybody that is going to go to the competition with us, you have to be an SAE member. So become an, the mem a member of SAE International. It's at SAE.org. You can just follow the links. And the membership for a student is 20 bucks. So it's not too big a deal. And then to get a hold of us, there's Facebook. You can just send us a message. A few people have been doing that so, uh, already. The other thing, you can email us, me. Uh, I set this email up for uh, this, gl this club. It's saewolfpackracing at gmail.com. Or you, know, you find somebody, know somebody, get in touch with them. They can probably help you out, get some more information, and then show up. And that's pretty much it. Oh, one more thing. Our next meeting is tomorrow. Uh, it's, what, 7 o'clock. It's following the ASME meeting in SEM 234. Uh, two, two so show up there, and we're going to work on a lot. We've got a lot of things to get done, but that's the place to be tomorrow. All right, thank you. Sounds like a fun club to join. Um, okay, so a couple announcements before we get to the main event, which is our guest speaker, Dr. Ed Azadi from the Biomedical and Electrical Engineering Department. Cap me number four is due tonight at 11.59 p.m., so please make sure you get those done. The last one, number three, only about 75% of you completed those, so um, please don't forget that this evening. Checkpoint three is Wednesday and Thursday, this week between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Okay, 10 to 5, so a little bit different hours, again, Wednesday and Thursday. On Wednesday, in light of checkpoint three, there is no lecture, so you have that time. Um, if you need to meet as a group, <laughs> then you guys can do that at 4 o'clock and, and come for your checkpoint. Um, I would encourage people to come on, other, uh, on, on Wednesday morning and Thursday as well, though, so the line doesn't get too long. Um, no main lecture skills lab on, on Monday. It's Veterans Day, so you guys have Monday off from school. If you didn't remember that, yeah, woo, yay. <laughs> um, and then skills lab flowchart homework. That is due the night before your week 12 skills lab. So that'll be next Tuesday through Monday. You guys have a homework. It's um, similar to the style of the Excel homework and MathCAD or MATLAB you did earlier. So if you haven't been to lab yet, um, you will get notice of this and, and keep that in mind. Um, last but not least, checkpoint four is in two weeks in the EDL, and it's the Tuesday and Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So I would encourage you and your group to talk about that early okay, and figure out your plan for that in case people have travel plans for Wednesday. So Tuesday and Wednesday for checkpoint four right before Thanksgiving. All right, you guys know the drill for checkpoint three. Um, we've talked about it a ton. So Wednesday, Thursday, 10 to 5, you've got to be hovering, and you need to prove that you can propel yourself also. Um, check out the grade sheet, please, to make sure that you can earn full points. All right. <laughs> um, we've noticed a lot of teams have left their things in the, in the EDL, and it's very obvious which teams they are because they have your team number written all over them. Um, you are not allowed to leave stuff there at all. So you need to pick up your things and get them out of there. Otherwise, um, they'll be given to the bears at feeding time. You know there's a large bear population in Tahoe. I'm not sure they like styrofoam, but they will. We'll bait it with meat. So please make sure, I'm joking, uh, please make sure, though, that you get your stuff out of there right away. You cannot store things at all. All right, so clicker question number one is, how long can you store project materials in the EDL? Indefinitely until the final exam day, until checkpoint three, overnight, or zero days, as in no overnight storage today. Ready, go. I'm going to cut your time a little bit, so 10 seconds. Three, two, one, hurry up, last minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the 2% of you who said indefinitely are trying to poison bears with styrofoam, please don't do that. <laughs> That's not nice. 
Get your things out of there after class today. The EDL is open till 7. Go get it. All right. So next off, we're, we're lucky to have a guest speaker today, so I just want to welcome Dr. Ed Izzati. Again, he's professor. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Ed Izzati comes to us from the Department of Electrical and Biomedical Engineering. Okay, and then my pointer is pointer is this one, and this advances. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Um, I am going to take about fifty minutes of your time to talk about a few things that we do in electrical engineering. I think you'll have fun listening to some of the questions I'll ask you. So uh, let me go on as far as telling. Uh, telling you what I'm going to cover here, give you a little bit things about my background, and uh, I'll have five questions to ask you. They're simple questions. I'll talk about the power systems. Power system, you know, if you, do, if you don't have power, you really cannot do much. And you do a lot at, uh, if you're in electrical engineering, you deal a lot with power system. Why is the light on when you need it? We're not talking about power plant, but we are talking about the power system. And I think the question I'm going to have have your answer is along those lines, and I think you'll enjoy it. I promise you'll have some fun questions asked. Talk about the past, present, and then I, I don't think I have any time to talk about the smart grid, because it is the buzzword of the day, and a lot of people talk about the smart grid. So, as far as the background, uh, let me just go back and talk about my own background. I uh, was pretty good in math and physics. I went to school in Oklahoma, and um, I picked up electrical engineering because it had a lot of physics and math and so on and so forth, just for the challenge of it. My mom and dad both were teachers, so, um, so I picked electrical engineering just for, as again, because it had so much um, abstract and math and so on in it. And I really am glad that I did it. Uh, when, I, um, when I was, uh, I, I went through a school and, and worked as a waiter in restaurant, I did grading, I did tutoring, I did all kinds of stuff. When I was a senior, I had a big, huge scholarship, which was very nice because it paid all of my tuition. When I got the bachelor degree, I asked my father, I said whether I should, I had actually two job offers. I asked him whether I should accept the job offer or go, or go to graduate school because the graduate school came to me and, and they were giving me a scholarships. And uh, my dad says there is no reason why you shouldn't go to graduate school. So I got a master's degree. I had then another two years. And uh, again, I had two job offers to go work for the industry. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what should I do, PhD or, or master? He said, no way. You got to get your PhD. So I got a PhD, and I'm glad I did. I worked for the industry. I, I um, worked on some, um, on some government project. At the time, I had to have clearance, which I did. It was on some sort of a well, uh, Biden's system with White Sands, New Mexico. Then I worked with Los Alamos on some fancy project, again, classified. And then at the end of that, uh, I had a graduate student, said, Dr. Zadi, everybody has to have practical experience. I, I was a pretty good teacher, I thought. So if I went and worked for the industry for about five years, and after that, I wanted to come back to teaching, so then I came to UNR in 1983. The first 17 summers, I worked for Sierra Pacific Power Company, and I had extra paychecks, because I didn't have to work at the school. And um, so I've been here for about 20, 30 years now. Actually, 30 years, 80, 83, almost 30 years. So that's my background. And, uh, 
The area of power system is really very interesting. As you'll see, I'll have a little fun problem for you guys to answer. I think you'll enjoy it. I promise you'll enjoy it. Okay, now as far as power system, as, as we go along, I'll have some questions I'll ask you. Um, so let's just go on. Here, you guys look at it and give me an answer. Electric power is the product of voltage and current. True or false? True. You have to have the voltage. The voltage is 120 volts or something, 110 volts, and you have to have some currents. So next one, electric energy consumption during a given period is, complete, is computed by finding the area under the power curve over that time period. True or false? It's energy. So if you have power, if you have a powerful man standing there and it doesn't do any work, you haven't got anything. So it has to go over time. So that's true. Next one, our MV energy electric bill is based on our energy consumption. True or false? Energy consumption, not power. True or false? True. This is interesting. Just a few questions before I get into the main topic. In northern Nevada, three compact fluorescent lamps. Compact fluorescent, you have, some of you probably have that. Those are the squiggly looking light bulbs, right? 13 watts, normally they give you the lights for a 60 watt power, I mean incandescent lamp. 13 watts each, typical lamp these days, turn for 10 hours, cost five to 10 cents, 10 to 20 cents, 20 to 30 cents. True, I mean which one? It's A basically. So remember, 13 of those watts, I mean, three of those light bulbs. If you put three in the, in the house, you really, I mean, in the room, you'll have a lot of light. Ten hours, you spend only five cents. It's a pretty good price. Next one. Therefore, instead of having a beer for five dollars, <laughs> you can keep the lights on for ten hours per night for about three and a half months. It really is a cheap thing that you have. Right now in New York, one of their biggest problems is that because the power line is down, just get up in the morning, and if you don't have power, you really are handicapped. So it really, so pretty good, pretty good deal. If, if they come to you and they increase the price of the power twice as much, are you going to say, I'm not going to have it? I don't, I, I don't think I would. I need them, the microwave, the coffee pot, the iron, the lights. Whatever. So we really are so much dependent on it that it is a national security issue. If you get the power out, like there was a big outage, I will have some slide in here. The government comments, how come this went out? So anyway, I get into that. Next one. Here is another question. Even though the nominal supply voltage is 120 volts for the house, which is 110 volts, it could change a little bit up and down. The 60 hertz, the, the 60 hertz, our power is a 60 hertz power, meaning over one second, if you put it on a scope, if you're in electrical engineering, you can put it on a scope. 60 times it goes up and down. It's, it is a sinusoidal function. So answer that question. Frequency, the voltage, you see power can become 110 volts. Two o'clock in the morning, under 12, under 13. How come everybody's asleep? You do not have any, any kind of line drops, and therefore it puts high. Two o'clock in the afternoon, probably 110, 109. So anyway, question, but the frequency 60 hertz, true or false? True. Could be within 401, as a matter of fact, if you go to the control center at Sierra Pacific. OK, now a little bit of a. I still haven't got to this question I'm going to ask you that is the fun thing, and I'm going to actually challenge you to answer some of those questions. Thomas Edison opened her street station in, 1980, in 1882. It was a DC power. What's the difference between a DC power and an AC power? This is direct line, right? If you look at it, it's, it's flat. Your battery pack, if it is a round one, is one and a half volt. So if you put it in a scope, it's one and a half volt. It doesn't change. Those um, rectangular shaped one are how many volts? 
9 volts. So again, flat. But he had a DC power system. And because he had a DC power system, every one mile he had to have a power plant because of the voltage drop. Because the voltage would be too low and people couldn't use it. So next one, Stanley came. He invented a transformer. A transformer says, if you change the flux, what's flux? Flux is basically, if you have a magnet, magnet has some sort of a, a power in it, right? Those fields out there are expressed by flux. He says, if you change flux with respect to time, you create electrical energy. So therefore, he invented the transformer, and, there, and that changed our power system to be an AC power system. And so the first one, by the way, went in California, in 1893, 2.3 kV, 1,000 volts. House is 110 volts. So 2,300, no, 2,300, right. 12 kilo. What is the highest voltage that we have in this country right now? Anybody can guess? 765 kV. What's the highest voltage line that the power company has? Uh, I mean, our power company, 345 kV. They are going to add a line that's going to connect the north to south, and it is a 500 kV, kV and it will be the first transmission line in the state of Nevada, which is a 500 kV line. 500,000 volts. By the way, if you drive, sometimes you see this big, huge tower, and those lines are in there. I'll have a picture of that. OK. So in the old days, when I went to school, basically what you had, you would have a, a power plant you would generate the power. You would go over the transmission line, step it up, because as you step it up, the loss is going to be easier. I mean, it's going to be a smaller when you transmit. And then you step it down and eventually serve the home. When I was at Arizona Public Service Company, Arizona Public Service Company has peak load during summer, but it doesn't have peak load during winter, because the weather is, is fine during the winter. Public Service Commission, so then when we're out there, during the summer, we would have four or five plants that we, that we would have to bring it to commission, well, I mean, start them to work, because we needed those power only like a month or two of the year. So then the public service, public service commission came, said, hey, all of these customers are paying for all of these extra power plant to work only a month or two, and it is not economically feasible, so we would like you to connect to other utility company, run these plants all the time, and sell the power during those times that you don't need it. Does that make sense? Right? So that's what happened. But the problem with that was, when you connected it, when you connected to, for example, I was at Arizona Public Service Company, when you connected it to PNM, Public Service Company New Mexico, or Southern California Edison, and so on and so forth, you connected, and when you connected, what happened? You had a huge system. There was a fault, I remember. Fault means abnormal condition, things that you don't like to happen to your system. There was a fault in Seattle, and El Paso electric generator went off of the, uh, off of the grid because of stability problems. So the system became a huge, I mean, vastly interconnected system. You literally can be in San Diego, and I promise you, you can take a truck from there and drive, I don't know, a month, whatever it takes you, to go all the way to Montreal and, and trace transmission lines because they're connected. So now we have a hugely connected, interconnected power system that they are dependent on each other in terms of their behavior. So analysis then includes, let me go back, includes you have to have a large scale system because everybody is connected. Now, notice what happens. We, we're going to get to a question. These are some of the functions that happens within a power company. You will have basically generation. That's one end of it. Mechanical engineering. As mechanical engineers, you are going to generate. You have the turbine and so on and so forth. You generate the power. Once it's, once it's an electrical quantity that it is electrical, then in the distribution system, so on and so forth. So here, Remote control, economic operation, distributed generation, all of these. Transmission, you're going to bring it. 
distribution and utilization. So these are all of the factors that power company people basically have to deal with in order to bring the power to you. Now, let's just go to this problem that we have. The transmission lines are really very intelligent system. It, it single port tripping, what, it, what does that mean? We have each of our line has three phases, phase A, phase B, phase C, because it's much more efficient to have a three-phase system than a one-phase system. Supervisory control and data acquisition. Somebody, if you, if you right now go to MV Energy, their headquarters is on the third floor of that big building. Double door, all of them inside. You cannot just walk in there because you could push a button and take a power plant offline out there. So those operators have control of the power system. So we have sophisticated power system. So let's go to distribution, high speed relays. Relays means I am checking all the time to see what you're doing. I want a little bit, um, we, we are moving in, into this question I'm going to ask you, so you need to be prepared. So high speed relays, intelligent reclosing operation. 75% of the time, false or abnormal conditions are temporary. Meaning if, if a tree arcs over a line, it's going to spark, the tree is going to burn, the line is still is going to be there. So if I am tripping a line because I had too much current, I am going to reclose it back. So reclosing operation, escape the system. Now next one, generator, large three-phase synchronous machine, Palo Verde, Palo Verde, Example of large machine. I've, I've worked on the protection of this plant. 1559 MVA. M is what? 10 to the 6. MVA. Mega volt ampere. Remember, voltage times current. Volt ampere. Mega volt ampere. One of those generators can provide the entire Sierra Pacific load in the north. Approximately 10, point, 10 billion dollars in 1983. It was the biggest project in the state of Arizona. Now, planning and, and completion 10 years. It took 10 years to do it. $10 billion. By the way, if a, if a power company is building a power plant, a power company is building a power plant, where does it get the money to build it? Answer? No? Government doesn't do that. No? Borrow. Borrow, borrow from people, borrow from banks and so on and so forth, and banks are going to charge you interest rate. And you cannot charge the customer until that plant is online. So for 10 years, $10 billion, that's a lot of money. So now, next one. Um, okay, here is something very interesting that gets into the question I have. If the generator operates in 60 hertz mode, look at the 60, this is the 60. It's going to last you forever, see? This is the a GE manufacturer curve for a plant that cost a $10 billion. Notice what happens. If you go offset, meaning if you are operating at a different frequency. I picked up this point in here. This is 56 and a half hertz, right? 50 second, 50 six and a half hertz, how long is that, is that generator going to last? One second. It's a huge generator. The size is the size of a football field, I swear. I was in there and I set the relays there. So, one second. So, as a power company engineer, I will not allow you to operate the generator at any speed other than this thing here. Because manufacturer warranty is going to be gone if you did that. Now, so here it gives you all kinds of time. This is a manufacturer supplied curve. So go here. Let's go to this example that I'm going to ask you a question to answer. And for those of you who have been concentrating in terms of listening to me, I hopefully you can answer. Here is a generator. Valmi power plant is 180 miles from us. Valmi is burning, but we have a lot of coal. We burn it and we bring the power to Reno and we spend it. Okay? I put a whole bunch of generators in here. This is this, assume this is a Sierra Pacific system here. 
we have generator, several generators in here too, but all of our customers are in here. So we have high voltage line, and it brings the power from Valny all the way to Reno area. These lines are expensive. I'll, I'll have a slide in here, and you'll see. If there is an abnormal condition, let's say some arcing, some fault, these are re relays because if the current, just like in your car, you have a fuse in your car, and if something crazy happens in your car, the fuse is going to burn so that it doesn't mess up the radio or something in the car. So notice, here then, these protective devices are there. I told you about breaker and opening and closing. These are breakers, basically, that open up the line. So open it up. Valmi is a 300 megawatt generator, 300 megawatt. So it's a whole bunch of customers. How much, how much does each of the house take, average, your homes, let's say, if you had a house? How many kW? Two and a half, three and a half kW. This is a 300 megawatt generator. Now, consider this. There is an abnormal condition in here. The relays is going to look at the current. The currents are too much. And the relay says, this is too much. I'm not going to allow it to go through. And so they open it up at the two end. All right? Now, concentrate on my problem. It's going to happen. So they are going to open up this line. When they open up this line, what happens? I am burning. If you go to inside of a boiler room of a power plant, it's a huge field. If you looked at your heater in the house, a gas heater, there is boiler in this small one, right? Consider a huge area where you burn basically gas or coal or something to heat some water. So boiler now, and by the way, one more thing. These relays take about two cycles, two cycles. One second is 60 cycle. Two cycle, three cycle, four cycle to open up the line. So one twentieth of a second, right? The line opens up. So look here. So this relay and that relay opened it up. So what happened? This generator that was just putting a split second ago was putting out 300 megawatts, now cannot put anything onto the system, right? Are you with me? Cannot put anything in the system because you just tripped the line, right? You took it off. 300 megawatts you have at that end. And now, here, all of us in Reno were using all of that 300 megawatts here, right? So now what happens to, to this generator? It cannot go anywhere. So what happens to the generator? Answer. What's going to happen? You cannot take all of this steam out instantly. It's 1 over 20th of a second. So what's going to happen to that generator? It's going to speed up, right? The energy is going to go into the shaft of the machine. It's going to speed it up, right? These guys had help to the tune of 300 megawatt, and now they don't have help. So what happens to, to these generators? They're going to slow down, right? Right, everyone? Slow down. So now, let's go back to our curves. That's that curve. You cannot speed it up because you're, gonna, you're going to break the shaft. Right? You cannot speed it up or you cannot slow it down. Right? So tell me what are you going to do? Answer. Some of you have been laughing there. Go ahead. Answer. What do you do? I cannot, I cannot lose the power. What am I going to do? The line has to take it out too much power, right? No, I opened up the relay, the line is open. This is going to speed up, that's going to slow down. That's a no-no, that's a no-no. So what am I going to do? Okay, here, here is the solution. We will get into the generator goes to over. The generator has an over, over frequency protection, automatic, because you don't have time to, to mess around. Everything is automatic. The relay engineer set that thing. So the over frequency protection is going to take that generator off. Right? The, the generators back, the ones, these guys in here, are slowing down. Generator has under frequency protection, meaning if you're under 60 hertz, I'm going to trip you too. So then we have a blackout, right? 
Black hog is, is a no-no. Now here, let's go on with this. So here is option. Why don't we build two lines? Right? Separate them as much as we can. Huh? The two line, we have two lines that goes to Valmy. Closest place is like 300 feet. That's because of the terrain and so on and so forth. So, have a, so if there is an airplane crashing onto a line, it doesn't do the second line, it doesn't take it down. So next one, so yeah, you could add another line. However, here, here is the cost of building a line. One million dollar a mile. Oh, sorry, no can do, it's too expensive. All right, so what am I going to do now? Yeah, build a line, but building a line, how much time do you think in this country it takes to build a line, a transmission line, high voltage? Yes. What's the biggest, what is the biggest issue in terms of building a transmission line, high voltage transmission line in this country? Okay. Traffic, environment, that's it. It's not engineering. Land, getting permit. Indian territory, forget it. You cannot put anything here. Forest service, forget it. You can't do this to anywhere. Farm, forget it. I'm not going to give you my land. So things become very expensive. Environmental study, it takes 17 years in this country to build a transmission line. How much time do you think it's going to take in China to build a high voltage transmission line. Yes. Two years. High voltage line. Build it. That's it. So, anyway, so it's expensive. So now I have this problem that is going to happen, and I swear it does happen. On a thunderous stormy night, the lines trip, we have accidents, we have flooding, we trip lines, and so on and so forth. So I, I now I'm going to go back to my original question. Some of my generators are going to speed up, and I'm going to trip them out because they're going to burn. I mean, they're going to, the shaft is going to break. Some of them are going to slow down, and I'm going to trip them too. And if I do that, I have a, a, a blackout. So the biggest challenge, I already asked you this. It is not the cost of equipment. It's not engineering analysis. It's land purchase environmental study. Okay, here is another question. Renewable energy, everybody talks about it these days. I get back to the question in a second. Building the photovoltaic, wind, or other renewable energy are, are the biggest challenge for this application, true or false? False. The, the, the biggest challenge is transmission line, basically, and getting the right of way to, to bring it over. What happens when a plant is tripped? Here is the next slide. The last one that happened in, in 2003, 50 million people, I bet you New York information is going to come out too. 50 million people lost power, contributed to 11 deaths, cost 60 billion. Why is it so expensive to lose power? Explain. Huh? Why? Yes, sir. Traffic lights, right. Elevator get stuck, hospitals, right? People, a jewelry store has all kinds of stuff in it. It's dark and just go grab it. There is no security or anything, right? Uh, radio station, TV station, all of them are down, right? So if it was a terrorist act, well, that's, that's the best thing you can do. In, in some foreign countries, you basically have soldiers guarding the substation, the power plant. Because the best thing you can do is to Knock it down. All right. So now, so I have that problem. Because if the plant is tripped, if I have blackout, I have that problem. So what am I going to do? You're my engineer. I just hired you. This is the question I'm going to ask you. The line is going to trip. Some generators are going to speed up. Some generators are going to slow down. You're not going to go build another transmission line. You already built it. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to take you out 17 years. So what is it that we have to do in order not to lose customers? Explain. 
wonderful, wonderful comment, but it is not big enough. The magnitude that we talk about is huge. No can do. Yeah, a small scale maybe, but for, a, for the 1,000 megawatts and this kind of stuff that we have, not going to happen. So what? Suggestion. That was good. What else? Okay, here. Here is an example I use. It, it is a silly example. Consider a carriage, old carriage, with six horses. And it has to travel, I don't know, 20 miles an hour. Has to. Absolutely has to go 20 miles. So, one of the horses dies. Died. And you still have to do 20 miles. And, and let's say he's not ham hampering the traveling of the other five. He's dead. He just cannot pull anything. What do you do? You have to do 20 miles an hour. Let's say you are the carriage driver. You have to do that. What do you do? Yes. Throw away some weight, right? I agree, but instantly. This is, this is this because this, this generator, I can do a lot of stuff in two minutes, by the way. I am talking a split second, one over 20th of a second. Remember, a fault happens, the relay is going to trip it in two cycles, right? Right, everyone? Two cycles is not much time. The steam is burning. There is not, not much I can do. So what can I do? Throw some luggages out, right? By the way, the toy lines, before we get there, the toy lines that I have with my friends, with my buddy, MV Energy has toy line with pg &E, with Idaho, and with Utah. I just increase, I ask them to give me a little bit more power, right? That's, that's I have a toy line, right? Give me more power. But you know what happens? When you exceed the limit of a line, those companies who own the line are going to stop giving you anything, just open up their line, because they don't want you to, to bring them down. It's like going hiking. You and your friend are there. This is again a silly example. You and your, your friend are going hiking. Your friend is sleeping, and it is falling down. And you grab his hand, and you try to pull him up. If you can't, what are you going to do? I'm going to let him go, because it, I don't want him to take me down. That's exactly what the power company does with, with those transmission lines. I will help you as much as I can, but if you are bringing me down, I'm going to open up those lines. And that's exactly what they do. I know it because I have done some of these things for the power company. So the toy lines are, all, are open, so you're isolated. Because you got all you could get from your neighbor, and they cannot give you 300 megawatts. It's just good luck. OK, so here, back to those horses. So then I throw out a, a, lug, a luggage out. I look, at the, I look at the speed, right? And if the speed I, I cut up, I mean, if, if I have that speed at 20, that's OK. And then if it is not, I have to throw out more things. I may even take a passenger and throw out. Right? Because I, if, if you have the mandatory condition that I have to do 20 miles an hour, that's what I'll do. So now, what do we do? Apply to the power company. What am I going to do? Those generators, the generator that speeded up, I tripped him. The generators that are slowing down, what happens? I am slowing down because they have too much load, right? So what should I do? Throw out some customers, right? Who do you throw out first? Here you're an engineer, and I, I have done this thing again. Who do you trip out first? Absolutely not. I wouldn't do the president. Go. Residential load, how about that? What is happening in a resident? They have a refrigerator, they are baking cake, they are watching TV and so on and so forth, three of them, right? Residential load, 15%. MV Energy has a 10-step has a under frequency load shed, 10-step. Step number one, 15% of the load are taken out. So it is like putting out, putting out luggage, and then you don't catch the speed. Now, what if 15% what if doesn't do it? I go to step number two. Where would you put the casinos? A lot of our are from Nevada. Which step would you put the casinos on? 10 step. MV Energy has a 10 step on the frequency load shed. Yeah. Anybody? Suggestion? 10. Who would be 10? 10 is the last ditch effort. Who would be 10? Who would be 10? Jail? 
sewer houses, right? Sewer plants, right? Hospitals, right? Because these are crazy stuff. So anyway, what we do and see the Pacific, normally three, four steps, we go back to 60 hertz. This happens within a split second. In a split second, we are back on. So um, here, let me just go on with my slide. Golden rule for the power company. Here, I, thou shall not cause the system blackout. Absolutely, I fire you as a, as a supervisor if you lost power. Blackout, I'm not talking about brownout. Brownout means you lose post part of your customer. So under frequency load shedding is the one that I'm talking about. For MV energy 10 a step, okay. So notice what happens then. I trip out all of those customers, right? So now I am back into 60 years. But you know then what I can do? I can call the power plant operator to ask them to increase the steam into the boiler room, right? Burn more. I can ask everybody to give me extra stuff. In about two minutes, I'm back online. If I trip a plant, it takes me 24 hours to come back online. All right? So that was the question. Now, we talk about this smart grid stuff, but I, I want to tell you a few things. I started about 15 minutes late, so I'm going to keep you keep here just a couple of minutes. A smart grid means I, you as customer, there is no reason for you guys to pay the bill for the electricity at the end of the month without knowing what the price was. When you go gasoline, when you go buy anything, milk, gasoline, anything you buy, you know what the price is. Why are we doing this with our power? We use the power for 30 days. At the end of the 30 days, we get a bill. Why shouldn't we as a customer be able to know how much it costs? Maybe I don't want to use the washing machine now. Because the price of the electricity is different per, per time a day. So a smart grid is going to enable you to do something like that. But people don't like a smart grid because they say, we can figure out what you're doing. Let me get to this slide. I'm going to sl skip a few slides in here and get to here. This is an IEEE picture regarding individual homes. This is a very interesting picture. Look at guys. Um, here is a refrigerator. See. If, if you run your refrigerator, I can tell that's what you're doing. If you have a kettle, that's what it is. If you have a toaster, you have air conditioner. I can tell exactly what's going on in your house. So there are some customers who are going to say, hey, you're going to know too much about my operation. Here is another, uh, uh, let me see, let's go back in here. After. Here, here is different people in terms of how Assuming how the data can be used. If I'm growing pots, let's say, in my garage at night, it shows. If I have a sick person on a kidney machine, it shows, right? And so people say, hey, you're going to have too much information on me, and therefore I don't want this. Does that make sense? However, well, this is, this is the way the society goes. Is going. I, you know, I go to Safeway, I'm going to, I buy a milk or something, they know because I have to punch a number, you know, to get a discount. So they know how much milk I bought, they know how much cheese I bought. So this is the way it's happening. I don't think the power company is going to go back and, and basically figure out exactly who does what. I think it is silly. Anyway, I am done. I was a little bit late starting, but it is, it is 10 minutes to 6. If you have any question, I'll ask you. I hope you learned something about the power system operation. I hope you. Okay. Okay. Anyway, I don't know. Hard to keep.